Once scientists discovered and agreed that DNA was the genetic material, then they wanted to know what its structure was, like what does it look like? It's too small to just look at underneath a microscope, at least we have special scopes that can do that now, but back then for sure not, it's just a molecule. And we look at cells under the microscope, which are much, much larger. Um, so they had to use you know, data in order to model and figure out what DNA structure was. So before this point, it was known that DNA, and RNA for that matter, were made of nucleotides. And just to recall, a nucleotide is made up of a sugar, it's five carbon sugar, attached to a phosphate group, this P, attached to this group they've marked in C here, which is the nitrogen-containing base. It's called nitrogen-containing because there are nitrogens in these circles or in the rings of these molecules. There are four types of nitrogen-containing bases in DNA, and that's where you get the names ATCG from, which you may have heard of, DNA sequence ATCs and Gs. That comes from the nitrogenous base. And so then we end up with four types of nucleotides, which are, again, the sugar, the phosphate, and the nitrogenous base. In DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. That's where the D in DNA comes from, deoxyribonucleic acid. It's called deoxy because this Carbon number two here, this carbon, doesn't have an oxygen with it, just a hydrogen. You notice here that the carbon does have an oxygen and a hydrogen with it. In this is an RNA. So the deoxy is referring to the fact that there's not an oxygen there. The bases that you have in DNA are adenine, that's the A, guanine, which is the G, cytosine is the C, and thymine is the T. This other base, uracil, is an RNA only, and we will talk about that in gene expression. Um, in the 1940s, Erwin Chargoff uh, found an interesting piece of data he didn't know what to do with. He measured the percent of each type of nucleotide in DNA. And what he found was that the percentage of adenine equaled the percentage of thymine. So this, this orange one here and this yellow one, they equal each other. And the percent of guanine dark blue, equaled the percent of cytosine, which is this light blue. He didn't know what to do with it, but that came, became important for Watson and Crick later when they were building their models. Another really important piece of data was this picture here on the right uh, in black and white. And it's not a photograph with the camera. It's a photograph um, of x-rays being scattered by the molecules of DNA. So basically it's called crystallography, x-ray crystallography. Um, and now we have more um, faster methods to do this, like cryo-EM. But uh, Rosalind Franklin was one of the best crystallographers in the world um, at the time. And she took pictures of all kinds of molecules, mostly proteins, but had also worked on DNA. And so what she found in this picture of hers, a very famous picture, was this X structure, which told Watson and Crick that it was a double helix so what that means, a helix is a curly Q or a spiral, and a double helix means it's two spirals going around each other. So basically it means two strands, both of them twisting. So what Watson and Crick did, James Watson and Francis Crick, in the 1950s was they built models of DNA using cardboard cutouts and then also things like this model on the right with you know sticks and balls. And they found eventually that DNA was this double helix structure because they used the data from Chargoff and from uh, Franklin and other scientists as well. And then they also found that the data fit when the nucleotides were facing the inside of those strands and they were pairing in particular combos. So A pairs with T and C pairs with G, which is why Chargoff got his data of A equals T and C equals G. And you can remember that because A and T are the straight letters in DNA, and C and G are the curvy letters in DNA. Watson and Crick found that the way to make their model work with the data that they had was that the strands had to run anti-parallel. Let's look at and the nucleotide again. It, remember, has that five carbon sugar in it. And in chemistry, we... Um, label the carbons in a ring by numbers. So this carbon here is carbon one prime, 
2 prime, 3 prime, 4 prime, and the one kind of outside here is 5 prime. Attached to this 5 prime carbon is the phosphate, and attached to this 3 prime carbon here is the hydroxyl group. 5 prime phosphate, 3 prime OH. And so this is giving this molecule directionality, where it's not the same on both ends. They had to have the strands of DNA running opposite directions and then attached by these weak bonds in between. So each of these, um, this is called a strand, so there's two of them. And the parallel part is because they run next to each other, the anti part is because they run opposite each other. And you can see that here. And the reason that matters is because uh, when we make DNA and DNA replication or we're going to make RNA in gene expression, uh, it, the, the fact that the 3 and the 5 always have to be opposite each other makes us build DNA in certain directions and build RNA in certain directions, which influences the process. They discovered that these nucleotides on the two strands were attached at the nitrogenous bases by these weak bonds called hydrogen bonds. And that's important because they're sticky, but not glued together. And so that stickiness means they can be separated relatively easily, which is really important for DNA replication and for gene expression, because the DNA needs to be accessed to be able to do, like each strand needs to be accessed to do those processes. So it can just break, it can just unstick basically. Whereas the nucleotides along the strands, like each strand itself, was made of really strong bonds between each nucleotide, which meant that these would not break easily unless there's a chemical reaction. So the DNA molecule doesn't break itself, but it can separate the two strands. Those are the basics of DNA discovery and the understanding that the structure of DNA is a double helix.